So on behalf of Pastor Rick and Sister Jeannie Alanis, I'd like to welcome you out once again this evening. Uh, we've been having some powerful, powerful prayer services here on Friday nights, amen. And I heard it said, uh, you know, by a couple of different people that Friday nights are back. So we can be a lot of different places on Friday night, but it's, it's an amazing feeling to be in the house of God on Friday night, amen. So tonight, we're going to talk a little bit um, about prayer, but I would like to thank Pastor Rick, uh, Pastor Sonny, first and foremost. Uh, you know, without Pastor Sonny being obedient to the call that God had placed upon his life, I don't think many of us would be here tonight, amen. And then also Pastor Rick and Sister Jeannie for their faithfulness and their commitment to two churches in the ministry of Victory Outreach and to each and every one of us, uh, the ministerial staff here um, in Victory Outreach City Church of Chicago and also all of uh, my co-laborers in the Lord. Amen. So bless the Lord here tonight. Amen. Um, with that being said, if we can take our Bibles to the book of Exodus chapter 17. Exodus chapter 17. And if uh, you're taking notes this evening, uh, the title is simply The Prayer Team. The prayer team, Exodus chapter 17, and we're going to begin in verse 8 and end in verse 13. Amen. The word of God reads like this. It says, now Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. And Moses said to Joshua, choose us some men to go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. Joshua did it as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And so it was when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands became heavy. So they took a stone and put it under him and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. Verse 13. So Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Amen. So here, right before this story has taken place, is probably something that's very familiar um, to all of us here tonight is the children of Israel were called out of the wilderness of sin. At the command of God, they were called out of the wilderness of sin. Uh, they, 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 they landed in one city, and then they hit another city, and then they ended up in Rephidim. And this is where, um, this is where the children of Israel immediately kind of, they ran into some challenges. Do you have any challenges in your life tonight? I mean, well, the children of Israel, they ran into some challenges. And the, the big, their biggest challenge was that they didn't have any water. So this is where they began, the Bible says, to contend with Moses. And they started, they started complaining and, and asking Moses, uh, you know, different questions. And, you know, why would you bring us up out of Egypt? We've all heard the story to die here, right, in the desert. Mm -hmm. How many know their mentality, their mentality in this particular set of circumstances wasn't one of the spirit or uh, if it was kind of one of the carnal mind. Have you ever f b b found yourself in a set of challenges and, and found yourself complaining and murmuring about the circumstances that you're in? Do you know that you can be in the perfect will of God and still be in the most challenging circumstances maybe that you face in your life at any given moment. You can be in the perfect will of God and your life could be seemingly fall apart. Have you ever felt like the four walls of your life are falling apart around you? But at the same time, you know that you're in God's perfect will. Doesn't make any sense to us, but it makes sense to God. So... The story goes on uh, previously, and um, Moses, he, he, he strikes the rock. Water comes out of the rock. The miracle takes place, and the children of Israel, they are, uh, they, the, you know, from the miracle of God, they get water. So, and the story then goes on, and, and that's where we pick back up in verse 8 to 13, where uh, Amalek came and he fought against Israel 
and Rephidim. So they immediately faced some challenges. God produced a miracle for them. And then they faced some more challenges. And this time, the challenge comes from kind of a place that really it never should have come from because Amalek was Esau's grandson, who is the twin brother of Jacob. So with that being said, Amalek would have known about the promise that God had given to Abraham that went down to Isaac, that went down to Jacob. Can I hear somebody say amen? So it's interesting that knowing that the children of Israel have been given the promise of God that Amalek still attacks the children of Israel. Now, this was an unprovoked attack. And I'm going to talk a little bit about prayer and some other things quickly. This was an unprovoked attack. Have you ever been attacked? It felt like you've been attacked and it wasn't provoked by anyone or anything. You're just doing what you're supposed to be doing. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, you feel like you're being attacked on all sides. Can I hear somebody say amen? An unprovoked attack. Amalek's method of, the, of attack was despicable. Somebody say despicable. As we see later in Deuteronomy 25, 17 and 18, it says that remember what Amalek did to you on the way as you were coming out of Egypt. How he met you on the way and attacked your what? Your rear ranks. All the stragglers at your rear when you were tired and you were weary and he did not fear God. Our adversaries don't play fair. And I'm not just talking about the enemy. I'm not just, not, not just talking about the devil. Our adversaries in general don't play fair. They attack when we're not looking at the rear. They go after the weak stragglers that are tired, weary, and vulnerable. You ever felt tired, weary, and vulnerable in seasons where it's even difficult to pray and you feel like you can't get a hold of God and connect with the Lord the way that you know you should be or you want to be connecting with God? You know, in those seasons where you're tired, weary, and vulnerable, where there's a lot of different things going on and maybe your routine for seeking the face of God is kind of, it's kind of messed up and things aren't going the way that they should be going and, and you, you just want to get a hold of God, but you just can't seem to get there in those seasons you'll find, I bet. I, 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 I bet dollars to bucks you'll find that in those seasons is where you start to take shortcuts. Hello, somebody. In those seasons, you start to take shortcuts. Thursday, I took a shortcut. I'm kind of feeling like that a little bit, right? But Thursday, I took a shortcut because maybe, you know, my routine is a little bit messed up right now and I felt like, so some things aren't as important, right, as they really were. You know, you know, if you feel like you don't have time for things, right, when you're real busy. And we had Holy Ghost Thursday here at the church, and I borrowed a speaker from Adam that I didn't even, I didn't call and ask him to borrow it. See, normally I have conviction that I will always ask and borrow, to borrow something for somebody. I already apologized, so it's cool. Right. <laughs> but the point is this. The point is this, is that because in those seasons where we feel tired, weary, and vulnerable, those are times where we can take simple shortcuts. Can I hear somebody say amen? And when you're feeling tired, and you're feeling vulnerable, and you're feeling weary, and your adversaries don't play fair, those are the times where you're going to feel the most difficult attacks upon your life. The enemy has no fear or reverence for God. And he does not, will not discriminate based on your condition. So no matter what your condition, he doesn't care if you're feeling good or not feeling good. He doesn't care what happened to you on any particular day or what you're going through or how bad your life may. He does not care. He wants you to feel that way. He wants you to be going through those things. He wants you to be the one that, that, that's kind of separating for the, from the pack so you're an easy target for him, especially at the calling of God upon your life. He does not discriminate based upon your condition and ability to fight at any particular time. So moving on, Moses then instructs Joshua to go and do his part in this team effort. Somebody say team effort. He tells him to go out and fight against Amalek. So Joshua does exactly what Moses instructs him to do. So next we find Moses and Aaron and her going to the top of the hill with the rod of God in Moses' hand. It's interesting that 
God, Moses calls it the rod of God and God calls it the rod of Moses. It's indicative of the relationship that they had. That's we're talking about prayer. Well, Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill and there were three reasons that they went to the top of the hill during this attack by Amalek right there in Rephidim. Number one was so they could see the battle. Number one was so they could see the battle. Leader, your leadership needs to be able to see the battle. As leaders, you have to be able to see the battle. Number two, so they could be seen. So they could be seen. So those that were fighting in the battle could see the leadership doing their part in the battle. Number three, and most importantly, was so they could pray. The Bible says that when Moses would lift up his hands, Israel prevailed, and we let, when he let down his hands, Amalek prevailed. Suffice to say that this battle rested upon one man's prayer to God. So remember this victory, and it was a victory, was a team effort. Moses did his part and supported the battle from behind the scenes in prayer. He was busy in prayer. The fate of Israel in the battle depended on Moses' intercession because when he prayed, Israel prevailed, and when he stopped praying, Amalek prevailed. This amazing passage shows us that life or death for Israel depended on the prayers of the one man. Moses prayed as we should pray, with passion. With passion. How long has it been since you prayed with passion? I'm talking about that Holy Ghost, get in there, ugly in the face, not worried about who's around. Passionate prayer for God. You ever wondered sometimes why you feel like you don't have power? Usually I would say right here because you're not reading the word of God, but listen, I'm telling you, if you ever wonder why you feel like sometimes you don't got power to overcome circumstances in your life or negotiate or navigate obstacles in your life, you have no wisdom, no power, it's because you're not connected with God. Got to be connected with God. Sometimes I sound like a broken record, but some people try to serve God without God. (laughs) Doesn't even make any sense. But people do it time and time and time again. And they're always going through it, wondering why they can't get through the challenges in their life. When the children of Israel walked into Rephidim and they had no water. Listen, they must have not been connected with God because the very first thing they started to do was contend with Moses instead of seeking the face of God. Let's move on to Exodus 17, 12 through 13. Moses' hands became heavy. So they took a stone. I'm talking about the prayer team. So they took a stone and put it under him. And Moses sat on it, and Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and one on the other side. And his hands were steady until when? Until the going down of the sun. So Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Moses' job of supporting the battle through prayer was not an easy task, and it was difficult for Moses to continue. You know your leadership prays for you? And they pray for the church. And when you don't see them, they're praying for you. Hello, right? Right? They're standing, and and prayer's not easy sometimes. Isn't it difficult sometimes to get in there and pray? And I mean, sometimes it seems easier. Pastor Doug was talking about this on Thursday. Sometimes it seems easier to burn your time up when you're supposed to be praying, thinking about things. Sleeping, right? Pastor Doug shaking your ankle, right? The the victory homes know about that. Mm Hmm. Head in the seat with the ankle shake and you're asleep, but your ankle is steady shaking. Hello, somebody. 
And for whatever reason, it's easier to do that, or at least we think it's easier to do that than it is to push in to God. So it's, 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 it's difficult to connect with the Lord sometimes, especially if our prayer life has become a routine. We don't want a prayer life that is routine. I don't know about you guys, but I can't stand routine. I know routine is good and that we need it in our lives sometimes because it facilitates structure and it helps us to do the things that we know that we're supposed to be doing. But sometimes we just got to break out of the routine. Can I hear somebody say amen? amen? See, some of you are stuck in a routine here tonight of having lackluster, boring prayer in connection with God. Sometimes we just got to break out of that routine, shake it off a little bit. Get in there. Hello, somebody. I'm talking about getting up to the altar, getting a hold of God, and watching the hand of God move in each and every one of our, each and every one of our lives. There's power in prayer. It was easy to pray when you needed a miracle. See, Moses, he couldn't do it alone. The prayer warriors here in the church, they can't do it alone. The leadership, Pastor Rick, he can't do it alone. The ministerial staff can't do it alone. Can I hear somebody say amen? So we see two men, Aaron and her, stepping up and stepping in to doing their part in this team effort. Moses needed help in prayer. So Aaron and her supported his hands. Aaron and her came alongside Moses and literally held up his hands physically in prayer. This isn't a metaphor or anything like that. This is literally what took place. They helped him and partnered with him in the intercession for the battle that absolutely needed to be won. Because if it isn't won, biblical history would have been changed forever. Their help was successful. His hands were steady until the going down of the suns. Though this was Moses' work to do, it was more than he could do alone. Moses alone could not win the battle of prayer. He needed others to come by his side and strengthen him in prayer. So the Bible says that Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Because of this work of prayer, Israel was victorious over Amalek. So we're left here with no other option than to say what I've already said. If Moses, Aaron, and Hur did not do the work in prayer, Israel would have been defeated and history would have been changed. So here in this amazing passage, it shows us the importance of prayer. Life and death, the course of your history itself my history, your history, personal, individual, and corporate here in the church depends on our prayer life with God. Nevertheless, Joshua had to fight. Praying Moses did not eliminate what Joshua had to do. Remember, the prayer team, it's a team effort. Some people are praying, some people are fighting. Can I hear somebody say amen? Some people are behind the scenes where you can't see them, but they're praying. Can I hear somebody say amen? Huh? Right? Sometimes we, we, we feel like our leadership, because they're not there and we don't see them, sometimes that they're not doing their part in the work. They're doing the most important part in the work. See, Moses had to pray with Aaron and her lifting up his arms. The battle was won with prayer because that's absolutely the priority, but also through normal instruments that God uses. The work of the army led by the military genius himself, Joshua. Prayer is a downright mockery if it does not lead us into the practical use of means likely to promote the ends for which we pray. Spurgeon said that. Prayer is a mockery to God if that's all that we, so we're talking about prayer, but we're also talking about the work that absolutely has to go along with prayer. Right? I mean, it's, prayer's great. Prayer, I, was just, I was telling somebody yesterday that we can pray all we want, but if we don't put somebody over there to do the work, nothing's going to happen. Hello, somebody. Right? 
The prayer is the priority, but it takes men and women that are willing to work in order to see what we're praying for become a reality. Faith without works is what? Man, I could pray all that I want, but if I'm not putting feet to pavement, nothing's going to happen. I could pray for a job all that I want, but if I'm not getting out there going to interview after interview after interview, nothing's going to happen. Can I hear somebody say amen? You can pray for a, a, an unsaved loved one all that you want, but sometimes there are some things that you need to do and that I need to do on a personal level in order for that prayer to become a reality. Sometimes there's some connections that we have to make. There's some networking that we have to do in order for that prayer to become a reality. Sometimes we might be praying for an unsaved loved one, but we're treating that unsaved loved one like garbage because they're not serving God. It's not our place to be frustrated in circumstances like that. It's our place to treat them the way that Jesus would treat them. Can I hear somebody say amen? Amen. But I'm talking about the importance of prayer coupled with how many, how many know we have a lot of work to do, right? There's a lot of different things going on in the church right now, and there's a lot of work to do, and prayer is going to be the catalyst that we use for the work to become reality, but also there's a lot of work that we have to do physically, and God is looking for people that are willing to do the work, that are willing to put their hands to the plow and not just their mouth. Somebody say Amen. It's easy to talk, but it's difficult to walk. And I hear you say amen. Prayer, coupled with the work, is how we're going to see all of this become the reality that God wants it to become. There's power in prayer. Prayer moves the hand of God. And I'm talking about a, a genuine prayer. Not, not, the, you know, not, 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 not that pharisaical type of just, you know, we're talking about the, the, the routine, the, the, the routine, you know, the routine prayer, the prayer where you say the same stuff every morning, right? And I mean, it's just, it's not even like, it's not genuine, you know, the word, you know, it's not, it's not real, it's not authentic. I'm talking about genuine prayer, I'm talking about that prayer where you just pour your heart out to God, right? That prayer where you leave everything, where you leave everything right there where you're on your knees, wherever your prayer closet is, it's all out there. You're not, hide, you can't hide nothing from God anyway, so you might as well just tell him what's going on, right? Genuine prayer, real not bootleg, hello, some, not generic, but that, that real stuff. That, I, 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 don't you get bored in prayer sometimes when it's the same old stuff over and over again? And I thank God that, that God gave me the heart of a worshiper because a lot of times I'm not even praying. I'm just worshiping God. I, I mean, I, I, God knows my heart. And yes, I pray. I'm not saying that I don't, but I'm saying that I know that as long as I'm worshiping God and and in the spirit, he knows my heart and I'm giving my, I'm giving those petitions to the Lord in the spirit as I'm worshiping. I know that God's going to come through. I know that God's going to come through. When I worship Lord, my prayer is no longer routine. It's authentic. It's genuine. Because in this, what does the Bible say? God seeks those that will worship him in what? In spirit and in God is looking for worshipers. Can I hear somebody say amen? I didn't want to get off track from the message, but it is what it is. God is looking for worshipers. Men, women that will pray, that will worship, that will give their life to God. Lay it on the altar in prayer and worship. One of the biggest things that, one of the biggest th- things that gave me breakthroughs in my life as I was as still developing and growing in God is being at the altar and worshiping God. Worship team makes fun of me because they can hear me over here singing while we're singing the worship songs. But I'm gonna do me, hello somebody, right? And you need to do you. Gonna hear somebody say amen, Amen. right? Getting a hold hold of God regardless of the way that we feel, of what's going on in our life, of who's standing next to us, regardless of, uh, 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 have you ever wanted to be the person that's up at the altar lifting up your arms and praying and when they make the altar call, you're stuck right there. Like you want to, in the spirit, you want to get up there, but you refuse to move. So I want to challenge, the worship team can make their way here tonight too. I want to challenge you tonight. I want to challenge you tonight to be the person that steps out of that seat. 
and comes up to the altar and gets a hold of God that prays, that worships, that loves the Lord. It's not ashamed to worship God. It's not ashamed to take that step of faith and just... A lot of people say that, well, God's everywhere. I don't have to go to the altar for, you know, for God to touch my life. It's not about the altar. It's about taking that step to the altar that God honors. Somebody say amen. Let's stand here tonight, amen.